Good morning, River Church. Good to see you. You have to nail down your important stuff outside today, don't you? It's going to blow away. Hey, um, I want to tell you about uh, some opportunities coming up here at River Church. And uh, the, the one that we like to highlight every January uh, would be the, the, the best way that you can get connected here at River Church with other people. Make friends, be, be a part of the community. There aren't a lot of things that I... Uh, I was going to say there aren't a lot of things that I, that I worry about. That's not true. I'm actually a worrier. But, but of the things that I worry about regarding River Church, the one thing that probably always rises to the surface is, is <clears throat> whether or not you are making friends and, and, and being woven into the fabric of our community or if you just you know, show up on Sundays. And so I'm not thinking of any one of you in particular. I think you, all, you, you guys are doing well in this area, but we like to just... Uh, make this available again every January or really highlight it. So I'm going to ask some people to come up here uh, in no particular order. Uh, Elise, would you come up? And if you'll just stand right here in the front. And then uh, Milan and, and Priscilla and Victor and Keith. And, um, and I'm going to tell you who these people are as soon as they get up here. I mean, you know who they are. but So, th- so each one of these individuals... Um, represent a gospel community. That's what we call small groups or community groups here at, here at River Church. We call them gospel communities. And so there are at least five groups represented right here. And let me tell you what they are. Um, because if you're not connected, this is the way to get connected. And, and uh, you know, we try to sort of hold your hand and help you get into a group, and that's good, but it also takes some initiative on your part. In a small church like this, you can just go and Take the risk and talk to somebody, and that'll be good. So Elise, um, Elise Garza right here, who leads your worship, she is married to Pastor Billy Garza, who's actually teaching. And you may, you probably know that, but in case you've been like seeing them make googly eyes at each other, and you're like, what, what, what in the world's going on? Something going on between the pastor and the worship leader. Well, you're exactly right. There is. In fact, we don't have time for this story, but I'm going to tell it really briefly. When I first out of college and Lydia and I were first married only a few months and I was leading the worship at this, really, at this big church and we had a choir and handbells and all that and, and, and she was in the choir and, and I would, we would sing and then I would go up and I'd sit right by her in the choir, in the choir uh, loft and, uh, and this was in, we were just barely out of college and it was a college church and we found out that some of the college kids were talking like, hey, I think... I think Randy really likes that girl in the, uh, in, the, in the choir loft. And then they had to find out that we were actually married. Uh, anyway, same thing here. Same thing here. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. They, they, they the Garzas, they lead a, a gospel community that's a co-ed gospel community uh, in, I'm going to call it Central Brownsville. Pretty close to here, just not just a mile or two from here. All right, so that's one group. Um, Milan and Elena, his wife, they lead a, a co-ed group. Uh, the Villarreal's lead a, a co-group, a co-ed group uh, in, uh, in North Brownsville. Uh, both groups have a number of single people in it and some married people in it. In fact, do we, are there, any, there are a few married people in your group besides, besides you all. But, but you, if you're single, you'd be comfortable. If you're married, you'd be comfortable in these groups. What? All ages. All ages. Well, yes, yes. And Keith, who does double and triple duty, he's in, he's in numerous groups. Um, bless you, Keith. Keith uh, is a part of a group that I guess I lead, although nobody's really leading it. We men meet here at 8 a.m. on Wednesdays, and we do life together. We talk about uh, what's going on in our lives. We pray for one another. We, um, I think all of us are reading through the Bible, so we talk about where we are in the Bible. and just It's very informal and coffee-induced, uh, in, coffee and uh, we have a good time. So if you're a man... Looking to an 8 a.m., some of you, that doesn't work. But if you're a man looking for an 8 a.m. group, come join Keith, me, several other uh, fellas on um, 8 o'clock on Wednesday. Um, Victor and Molly lead a group in their home, North Central Brownsville, something like that. I don't don't even know where you meet, actually. North Brownsville. Brownsville. And young uh, young adults. Young adults, co-ed, single, or married. All right. Victor and Molly. 
All these groups are currently running. They currently have people in it. You would jump in. You wouldn't be the only person there. It wouldn't be awkward um, unless you're awkward because they're, they, they would love to have you. Okay? <laughs> Priscilla Russell, um, who's my sister-in-law. You all know that, right? Uh, she, is, she leads a ladies' Bible study. And it, I don't know if the time, it, if they're maybe changing this semester or whatever, but you can come and talk to Priscilla. Uh, my wife Lydia attends that. And uh, so Priscilla does an awesome job of leading ladies in the legacy in which her mother led ladies. She's now doing that. So if you want to be a part of a ladies group Bible study, talk to Priscilla and she can give you the details. All right. So I invite you after the service, they're going to be around here. Uh, they're going to linger just a bit. Find them, talk to them. If you want to be in their group, they would love to have you. All right. Thank you guys. Bless you. Yay. We love leaders. We love people who sacrifice their time, their emotional capital to, to lead other people. So thank you to them. It's risky leading a group. You, all of a sudden, yeah, all of a sudden people have opinions when you're leading a group. So thank you for doing that. If you are, um, if you are a first-time guest, fill this connection card out, the one that you received, and hold on to it. And after the service, my wife Lydia and I would like to meet you at the back of the table and, and, uh, and get to know you a little better. If, you, if you've been here before, uh, you're a second-time guest, you're a regular attender, you're a member. Fill this out. Uh, let Pastor Billy and I know how we, we can pray for you. Put your, your prayer request on the connection card and then put it in the offering basket with your offering later on in the service. And in this way, um, Pastor Billy and I will know what's going on in your life and how to pray for you. There is one other gospel community that meets that I didn't tell you about, and that is um, our, our ICON. We consider ICON, which is our youth ministry, to be its own gospel community. It's, it's a place where um, middle school and high school students can go and find community and be connected to other people. And so that's another group. They meet on Sundays, and you can get more information from Pastor Billy or one of the other leaders regarding that. But that is, that is another another gospel community. All right, I'm going to invite you now to, in just a second, we're going to stand. Maybe find a new face, or maybe a face you're already familiar with, you hadn't talked to in a while, and say hi to somebody around you. Let's stand and do that. All right, if you would join me now and uh, go ahead and get, be seated and we'll pray and we'll continue on in our worship. Let me pray for us as we continue in worship. God, we are here today because we want... We want to hear from you. It's, it's scary to say it this way, so I, I pause a bit, but we want, to be, we want to be changed by you. We're here today um, not, not, not because we think we have to be or not because there's an obligation or not because someone made us. Not, not for most of us. Most of us are here with an honest desire to, to experience you, to be changed by you. We need healing in our lives. We need direction in our lives. We need a breakthrough in our lives. There are needs that, that, that we come to you to be met. Um, we, we are here today for really significant reasons. So would you move among us? Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today. 
Would you move among us and would you speak to us through your word? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Very, very brief review. We're studying the Gospel of Matthew. Just a real quick review. Um, we human beings live in possibly, uh, in, 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 in one of two realms of existence. If you've been here every week, you've heard this, so I'll be brief. But every human being that, that is walking this earth right now, Jesus said 2,000 years ago, we live possibly in one realm of existence or possibly in another realm. And, and you may scoot, move between the two. And you relate to people, and you should relate to people who are living in this other realm. It sounds, it sounds science fiction-like, doesn't it? Much of the, 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 the story of what God has done and is doing in the universe would make for a great movie. It's so exciting. Uh, but we live in one of two realms. There's the kingdom of the world in which um, maybe some of us in this room continue to exist in. And the kingdom of the world, it's familiar to us. The, the ethic, the, 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 it, it's got its own ethic, its own worldview, its own system, how we view everything that goes on around us. It is primarily made up of the, 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 the material existence that we know, the physical world that we know, and all the rules uh, by which culture plays and everything you see on TV and, and just how the ethic by which people live, that is the kingdom of the world. And we're very familiar with it. Um, and to some small degree, perhaps, um, many of us live in it. And then there is a different existence that Jesus spoke of, and he referred to it as the kingdom of heaven. And that's not some one-day pie-in-the-sky uh, you know, in, 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 in the future sort of an existence, but 2,000 years ago, Jesus spoke of the kingdom of heaven, and John the Baptist said when Jesus came, he ushered in the kingdom of heaven, this new existence, and it's got its own ethic. And Jesus' teachings that are hard, Jesus' teachings that are, that are counter-cultural, you know, the first ultimately will be last. And being humble, and 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 and, and being unknown is actually good. There's value in that, and the idea that we're not we're not measured uh, by our physical beauty or our bank account or our you know that that that's not the metric by which God judges our value. This. This kingdom of heaven ethic, Jesus invites us in. And I've said that, that some good philosophers have called it the upside down kingdom because it's so countercultural to the kingdom of this world. And so, so every one of us, we are, uh, well, most of us are wanting to exist in the kingdom of heaven while our, while our feet are still planted firmly on the ground. We're wanting to, but we struggle with pulling ourselves out of this other ethic, this other existence this other value system. It's really, I mean, all of the book of Matthew is really about that, and so it's good for me to touch on that every week. So uh, you're going to need something today to write with or, 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 you, or a device to type into because at the end of my sermon today, we're, gonna, we're going to do a little self-evaluation. You're not going to give it to anyone else. You can use an imaginary, uh, you know, use your, your finger if you want and just write on an imaginary little board or whatever, but you're not going to have to turn in, nobody else is going to see it, but we are going to do a little self-evaluation at the end of the service, so you, you're going to want something to write on or a device to type into. With that being said, let me begin with this. Jesus, in last week's passage, may have been two weeks ago, Jesus spoke on money, <clears throat> and he said this, he said, and we've got like three or four words that we're going to Matthew 5, he said this, so when you give, um, it's, an, it's, an important, it's an important four words. Um, Jesus was speaking to a Jewish crowd in his day. And you know the assumption that he made? 
The assumption that he made is that they give. And the reason was because they were born into this Jewish system, this religious system, in which, in which giving regularly uh, was just, it was ingrained in them. It was, it was a part of their, uh, their spirituality. And it was a good thing. And Jesus didn't judge that. Jesus wanted them to give. But notice, he didn't say in this teaching or really in any of his teachings, if you give. Uh, or he didn't really browbeat them to give. The reason, it's an interesting study. If you study the Gospels, the reason is Jesus never really did that. The reason is because he just, he just believed, he knew that they were givers because that was a part of their culture. Then you move later into the New Testament and you have the Apostle Paul and he is saying, he is saying you need to give. Like it, not, not if you give in the sense that it's optional, but Jesus, uh, the Apostle Paul, is having to teach people to give. Why? Because he's preaching into the Roman world. In, he's, he's seen Gentiles converted to Christianity, and they didn't grow up in a home in which it was just automatic. They just gave. It was a part of their spiritual lives. So Jesus never really has to teach people to give. He just teaches them the hard attitude that should, be, that should accompany their giving. The Apostle Paul, less than 100 years later, has to, has to teach people to give because they were, they were non-Christians coming into the church and needed to be taught that. I want to tell you about my dad. I talk to him. I talk about him sometimes. Uh, you, some of, a few of you knew him. He really got this. This, when you give, here's how you should give. Um, that wasn't a stretch for him. Like, for some of us, it's a stretch. It's hard to be generous. Um, my, my, my dad, to the best of my knowledge, and I knew him pretty well, my dad never worried about money or possessions. And it wasn't because he had a whole lot of money. But my father never worried about money or possessions. One time, I... Uh, brought home a, uh, a fish, I think it was a, a whiting or a sand trout from, uh, I guess I caught it in Boca Chica Beach, and, and I brought it home, I don't know why, but I didn't clean it at the beach, and I was going to clean this fish at home, and I was just a little boy, I was younger than boys, so I was probably 10, and I brought this, and I decided to clean it um, all on my own with my really sharp fillet knife, I decided to clean the fish on the hood of my father's car. So I got, a, I got a, like just one piece of newspaper and I laid it down on, my, on, 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 on the, the hood of my father's, by the way, brand new car, like, like four months old sedan. I laid this newspaper on, on the, uh, the hood of the car and I proceeded to flay this fish. I did, I, when I was done, I realized that the, yep, you got the, the, the knife cut right through the newspaper right into the paint of this brand new car, less than a year old, and there were actually gouges in the paint. And I, I was distraught. And I, I sheepishly brought my father out. And you know, it didn't even phase him. My, my father was not a man of, of material possessions. And it was hard to buy gifts for him because he, would, he didn't really want much. He would say things like, I'm content with what I already have. And like, I could say that, but, but like, he, it was really true of him. And he was a generous man. He was generous toward his children and his family, and he was generous toward the church. And he would, I recall, in this is the late 70s, I would sit in that car that he, you know, the, the, knife, uh, the knife gouges in it. We would sit outside of the church. This was, this was First Baptist Church. This was when they were still downtown, my earliest memories, we would sit out in the parking lot with his car running, the air conditioner on, on sunny mornings, and he would painstakingly, every week he would write, he would write out uh, a check to, to First Baptist, and then he, he would give regularly 10% of, of everything he made. He would, give, he would give to the church. And then he would pull out some extra money, and he would give it to me, little, little toe-headed Randy. That means you're blonde. Little toe-headed Randy. Um, he would give me a few bucks, and I'd put it in a in, a, in an envelope and put my name on it so that I had something to put in the offering. And he, what he was doing, he was teaching me um, to be generous, a generous giver at an early age. 
And my father was not a worrier. He was not an anxious person. In fact, he slept like a baby every night. And, and I remember he would tell me how much he valued being able to like sleep because he knew many people didn't sleep well, but he did. He slept well. And what I want to propose you to you today from the teachings of Jesus is that his life, my father's life, makes sense according to the teachings of Jesus. That, that all of that is not an anomaly. All of that, what I just said, is achievable. Generosity and, and lightheartedness. Freedom from anxiety. According to the teachings of Jesus, and if, like, if we're here, and we're going to give every Sunday and, and Wednesday nights or whatever, then we ought to say, like, like Jesus' teachings, like, we should test them. They better be true, else, else we're wasting our time. And so, so, so Jesus' teaching, the antidote to anxiety, according to Jesus, is getting our getting our eyes off of our possessions and off of our physical needs, not that that isn't important, but getting our eyes off of that and fixing our eyes on the Lord. Remember last week we talked about it. The owner of the cattle on a thousand hills. So that's, that's what we're talking about today. Jesus told us how to overcome anxiety. How to become a generous person. How, how, to, how to not be a slave to materialism. Materialism is a word you may not use. At the root of materialism is the belief, this, the kingdom of the world belief, and I'm not, I'm not judging people that live, I love the people that live in the kingdom of the world, but, but the, the t materialism, that's where it resides. Materialism is this. It's the, believe, it's the belief that we are only living in a physical world. Like that's really all that matters, is this physical world, and reality is solely bound up in this physical world, and in my physical appearances, and in my appetites, and my possessions, and, and the beautiful places that I can visit, etc. And all those are good things. Those aren't, those aren't immoral things. But materialism is wrapped up in this, in this thought that that's all that matters. That's, that's all that's real. And that sort of thinking can be, can be why some of us, we, we go to the gym or we, or we drive an expensive car or we fill our garages with things that we don't need or we can't even keep track of. Materialism can drive that. I'm not saying that any of those things are, are bad. Working out or driving an expensive car. I'm not, but, but materialism, living in the kingdom of this world, believing that reality only exists in the physical world, can drive us down that path. Now Jesus is about to tell us that, that freedom from worry, freedom from greed, freedom from a toxic addiction to possessions is possible. We already know that he's, he's called us to be generous people when you give. But see, he knows that, that, that there's still a deeper heart problem. And so that's what he's going to deal with today. So let's jump right in. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy. Let's stop there for a second. Vermin, that's like a rat. Um, if, you, if you use another translation besides NIV, which I use a lot of different translations, you're used to the word, do you know? Where moths and rust is what a lot of translations say. This one says vermin. Here's one. The actual word there is like the thing that's eating away. We don't have an English word for it. 
It's like it's it's uh, the the consuming or the eating thing. Uh, and so some some English translations say like rust. Some say vermin. But you know that feeling that like something's trying to eat my stuff. It's that. It's important because we feel that inside. We feel like somebody's try, something's trying to eat my stuff. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy. And where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy. And where thieves do not Break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is a lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. I'll just tell you right now, that that verse 22 is like a whole sermon. We're actually mostly going to skip that verse today, but it it is so valuable. We may come back to it another day. The eye is a lamp to the body. It's a window to your soul. Verse 23, But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Verse 24, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one, you'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, And this is, this is a transition because he says, therefore. So he's making a move here, a shift here. Therefore I tell you. Now he's going to talk about worry. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than the birds? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field, or see how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. You could say that the people that live in the kingdom of the world and abide by that ethic the pagans run after all these things, and your father and your heavenly father knows what you need, or knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. We're going to major on a few of these verses today. It comes as a package, but we don't have time to cover them all, else we'd be here till this evening. Um, but may the Lord give us grace as we study this. Okay, what does it mean to store up for yourself? To store up for yourself. It means just what you think it means. It, it means, it means uh, like don't hoard, um, don't save, but, but we know that saving is a good thing. We know that being... We know that the, the, the Bible teaches us that being good stewards of our stuff is good, but saving it in the sense of under lock and key, always trying to secure, always trying to guard, always worrying that the eating thing is coming, the rust, the vermin. And Jesus wants us to, wants us to, 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 to admit to ourselves, because we already know it. He wants us like, like, go ahead, admit it. Treasures on this earth, they're so fragile, they're subject to rot. They're subject to thieves. They're subject to devaluation. If you had any, if you had any money in the stock market in 2022, you know how fragile the stuff 
of this earth is. And Jesus wants us to, to, to admit to one another, to like embrace this, this, this kingdom ethic that the treasure in heaven is impervious. That means not, not at risk. Treasures in heaven is impervious, not at risk to, to predators, the, the eating away of things like rust or vermin. Treasures in heaven that we, that we send ahead, that we store in heaven, they're impervious to thieves. Now, now the, the age-old question is, well, how, what does Jesus mean? How do I, how do I, how do I uh, store up treasures in heaven? And in, in the whole reading of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, really, it's, it's, it's a simple... Uh, it's hard to argue against what I'm about to say, and that is that, that the whole of the teaching of Scripture uh, says that, that storing up for yourself treasures in heaven is uh, a bit of a, a metaphor uh, representing uh, giving your money away generously toward, 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 toward uh, kingdom-building causes, giving to the church, uh, giving to the poor, giving to missionary endeavors, Going financially without so that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, might increase. Storing up for yourself treasures in heaven. And then in verse in, and, and then in verse thirty or twenty one, in verse twenty one he says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. On earth, where every one of us lives, exists right now anyway, on earth. Draining, whatever it is that's draining your bank account, is that which owns your attention. That's what Jesus is saying. That which right now, currently, is draining your bank account is that which owns your attention. That's what Jesus is saying. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So in that, in that sense, the more you own, the harder this, the more challenging this becomes. In a sense, you become more at least susceptible to the consuming elements of this world. And, and when I say the more you own, I'm talking about everybody in this room because, as you know, we as a country, we as a nation, we as Westerners, as a people group, every one of us is stinking rich compared to the rest of the world. The more things I, 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 I own means the more things that I have to worry about and guard and protect for me, it started early. I remember as a little boy, I remember um, I had this, my first real, back then we called them 10-speed bikes. You know, I had the shifters and the, the curvy handlebars and the, 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 the brakes on the, on the steering, whatever. And I'm actually a cyclist. I don't know why I can't come up with these terms. But anyway, that kind of bike, you know, the squeezy, squeezy thing. And so, uh, so my first bike, I'm just a kid, and I remember... I remember that, that, that right here on the, what's called the top tube, this rust, this flake of paint came off, and this rust appeared on my bike. I don't know, it's from sweat or leaving it outside in the grass or whatever. So I started storing this thing as a kid, because I was a worrier. I started storing this thing in the hallway of our home, kind of a mudroom area, a hallway. And, 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 and you know what? That's when it began for me. My love for stuff that would rust, that could possibly be stolen, that is my first memory of being captivated mentally, emotionally, anxiously by stuff. And Jesus says, where your treasure is, it's where your heart is. Jesus says, yep. Where your treasure is, there goes your heart. 
Jesus is not concerned about your wealth. Jesus is concerned about your loyalty, the affection of your heart. I've seen this happen in too many, one time is too many, but too many times. And George, you know, and I were having lunch this week, and we were talking about this. We're, we're, both, uh, we're both boat owners, and I was saying, I, I've seen this. You, 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 you buy a boat, and then you find a new church. It's called the Church of the Lower Laguna Madre because you can no longer go to church on Sunday mornings because you're out on the water because, it's, because where your treasure is, that's where your heart goes. You, <clears throat> often, and this is, a bit, this is a, bit, a bit backwards understanding of this verse by some people's account, but often, often your money goes there first and then your heart falls. In fact, I would, I would tell you, if you want to care about something, maybe there's something like, I just can't muster up the strength to care. I really want to care about that, 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 that cause, but I keep forgetting about it. I don't care that much about it. You know how you send some money to that cause. Next thing you know, you'll really care about that cause. That's Jesus' teaching. Where your money is, your heart is. Where your heart is, your money is. Back in Albuquerque, a church that Lydia and I were part of planting 20 years ago, there was this fella that bought this expensive sound system for the church. Church plant still there, growing, thriving. He bought the sound system. All of a sudden, he cared about technology in the church because he had bought the system, and it actually got a little weird. But he, he, he would head up our audiovisual team, and he knew everything about the sound system, and he really cared deeply about something. I had been in a previous church with him, and he didn't give a rip about audio, the audiovisual, the, the technology aspect of the church. But in this church, he had bought that thing, and all of a sudden, because why? Because where your treasure is, your heart is. Where your heart is, your treasure is. And then verse 24, Jesus says this. He says, you cannot serve both God and money. No one can serve two masters. You'll hate one, you'll love the other, devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. What does he mean? What does Jesus mean? Well, you see, you can have two employers... But you can't have two owners. Something owns you. You belong to something. I mean, the word, the word slave and serve, that's all there, and let's not get tripped on that today. We've, we've talked about that in the past. Um, but the concept here is someone, our Father in heaven, or something, your possession. Someone or something owns your heart. You can't serve two masters. Now you can have money and it can be your slave, and that's the best way to live. You can have money and it can be your slave, or money has you and you are enslaved to it but you can't have two masters. You can't have two gods, small g, capital, capital G. You can't have two gods. You're going to love one, you're going to hate the other. Jesus said it's always that way. Let me say, this is not about being rich, this is not about being poor, um, Neither of those scenarios solves the problem. The one thing that poor people, many poor people, think about all the time is money. The, the one thing that rich people, many rich people, think about all the time is money. Having money or not having money does not really fix the heart problem. And then in verse 25, Jesus makes this, this pivot. It's really more of a transition. 
he says, therefore, the old school Baptist pastors used to say, when you see the word therefore, you have to think, what is therefore, therefore? Well, it, it's, it's pointing, it's, he's saying in light of the fact, Jesus already told us, your heavenly treasures are more valuable than earthly treasures. They're, 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 they're uh, impervious to um, being, being stolen from you. He said, he's told us that. And, and he tells us, and we didn't really unpack it, but your eye is a window into your heart. And he tells us, that every one of us is a slave. We're either enslaved to our money or we're enslaved to our Heavenly Father. He says, therefore, in light of all of that, in light of those, those ethics, those teachings, those, those truths, in light of that, Jesus says, now, the rest of this chapter, he wasn't speaking in chapters, but the rest of this chapter, I'm going to deal with anxiety. Is there a tie between my anxiety and my earthly possessions. And Jesus would say, absolutely. And let me, let me just take a pause here for a moment and just, 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 just say, make this statement. Not all anxiety and worry and mental anguish makes you a materialistic person. Like, they're, like we got a lot of junk. We're all broken. We all have wounds and there are I know I know I don't, I'm not I'm not calling you a materialistic person if you worried yourself to sleep tonight I don't know today though we're dealing with Jesus teaching regarding this and he says that often and you may have something else going on in your life but often a big a big source of our anxiety born out of how we view our material our earthly possessions. So he says, don't worry. There is this, 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 this truism in his teaching. Your worry is caused by your slavery to the world because you're living in the kingdom of the world. And in verse 26, he makes this lighthearted illustration. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't, they don't work. The Lord feeds them. Look at the grass of the field, the flowers of the field. They don't work. The Lord feeds them. Now, this, is, this illustration cannot be pressed too hard or it breaks, like, like all metaphors in the Bible. This cannot be pressed. Here's what I mean by that. You could read this to imply that you don't need to work, that God will just give you what you need if you just hang out like the birds. That's not the point. I think most of you know that, but maybe some of you need to hear that. That's not the point. The point is that God, He even knows the needs of the birds. How much more does He know your needs? How much more concerned is He? This is not a prohibition against work. It's a prohibition against worry. Verse 27, anxiety, He says, accomplishes nothing. I think we know that, and yet we need to hear it again. What does he say in verse 27? He says, Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And I wonder if Jesus just waited for a second for somebody to chuckle, because it's kind of a funny line, right? Like, has, that, has, has worrying ever accomplished for you anything. And he goes on. Verse 31 and 32 as we move toward the end of this teaching. So for those living in the kingdom of this world, material needs take on a primary consuming concern. For those living in the kingdom of heaven, God takes a primary concern. And then our Heavenly Father cares for our physical needs. And then finally, verse 33. The capstone verse on this whole passage. We're going to project it again. Um, verse 33, God says this. But seek first His, He's speaking of His, the heaven, his Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father. Jesus says, seek first God's kingdom. And, and seek first God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you 
as well, or in turn, or in time. He's saying in God's kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven, God's children are cared for. He knows what you need. And He will care for you. Okay, now, this is where we're going to do a little checkup. The rest of the sermon, you're going to preach to yourself. Actually, I've got a brief conclusion, but, but the, the, the rest of this is really you. Okay, um, do a little self-evaluation. You can do it in your head, but it might be better if you did a piece of paper or type in your phone, maybe take a picture of the question. You can, you can uh, evaluate it later because we're going to put these questions up. Um, behind the idea that there are two treasures... Earthly treasures, heavenly treasures, is the idea that there are two visions, two places where we fix our attention. Okay, so there are two, two types of treasure, earthly treasure, heavenly treasure, and then there are two different visions. We can, we can fix our eyes on the stuff of earth, or we can fix our eyes on the kingdom of heaven, and then behind that is the idea that there are two masters. We can either serve an earthly master, we can be a slave to our possessions, or we can be enslaved, serve our Heavenly Father. So there are two, there are two um, masters. So we've got the idea that there are two treasures, there are two visions, there are two masters, ultimately leading to this overall theme, which there are two kingdoms. In which one will you reside going forward? Because backward thinking leads to guilt. And I don't want that. But forward thinking leads to conviction. Going, walking out of these doors today. In which kingdom will you reside? And so on, answer honestly, but answer silently. Answer honestly, but only answer for yourself. Don't elbow your neighbor or your spouse or your mom or your child. This is for you. No one sees the answers besides you, but... But let's just take a moment, and I'm going to answer them for myself while you answer them for yourself. Question number one, are you storing up, hoarding treasures on earth? Um, or are you stockpiling, storing up for yourself treasures in heaven? How are you doing in that, in that area? So just answer that. Silently, I'm just give us some space, some quietness to think on that as I think on it for myself. If you're a student, this still relates to you. If you're poor, which many of us are, this still relates to you. Number two, are you fixing your eyes on the physical world? Or are you fixing your eyes on the spiritual realm? Like this week, what have you mostly thought of? Where, where is your mind your affections, your values, like the stuff that gets you up in the morning, the stuff that you care about, the stuff that you think about when you're supposed to be working but you can't help it, you're thinking about this instead. Does, are you drawn mostly to the physical world? And I wonder when that joint closes. I wonder what the hours of operation of that store are. I wonder, if, are, you, are you mostly drawn to the physical world or are you mostly drawn into the spiritual realm? Think on that as I'm silent and you're silent. Think on that.
Number three, and and there's obviously quite a bit of overlap on these, but, but there's a nuance of difference with each one. Number three, are you serving God? Or are you serving your possessions? Who or what owns you? Like when you hear that voice and you jump to attention, is it the Lord or is it your possessions? And the final question is this. It's the capstone. Do you reside in the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of heaven? And if you feel a weightiness to these questions, so do I. If you feel a bit of angst regarding maybe you know, your track record, so do I. But, but today's a new day and, and that's why Jesus teaches us. He calls us to a new kingdom new existence. The goal isn't guilt, but the goal is conviction. And the goal isn't isn't the damnation of your soul. Quite the opposite. Jesus wants you to thrive. Jesus wants you to be blessed. Jesus wants you to excel. But He wants you to excel for eternity. He doesn't want you to just be a temporary success. He wants you to excel for it. Jesus has come that you might have life. There is quite literally life in Jesus' teachings. Think on this, and we'll close with this. I've been, I've been captivated by this verse this week. It's ten chapters later. We're going to get there. Matthew 16 it's quite, it's quite, quite congruent with, t- with his teachings uh, from today. Matthew 16, there's what Jesus says. What good would it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I've just been captivated by that thought this week. Like, Jesus is honestly asking me, what would you give in exchange for your soul? Like a new boat? Higher pay? Your dream job? Would you give anything in exchange for your soul? And we would say, no, Jesus, no. And then we pray, Jesus, would you align my heart with your teachings. You're right, Jesus. There is nothing I would give in exchange for my soul. There is nothing more important. Amen. Let's pray. If you would just bow where you're at, and just for a moment, just be silent. We've, we've already been silent some, but just continue this moment of silence and, and prayer. Amen.